Welcome today to Proverbs Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. Today, we're going to continue on with Proverbs chapter 18, and we're going to be uh, starting with verse 11. And this particular group of uh, verses, that we're going to go through 11 through 15, this particular group of verses really kind of shook me a good bit this week. And I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of digging into some of the, the details behind what it is that the Lord began to show you know, it's it's funny because when we when you go through the Proverbs, many times you begin to see that there are verses that seem very similar to one another. And the truth is, is that they are to a certain extent, but they're actually bringing up another perspective of the of what that is that particular verse is talking about. And so from one perspective, it may it may look at it from a seemingly negative perspective. Another one could look from a, a seemingly positive perspective. And yet another can kind of weigh the balance between the two of those and recognizing the fact that we have the ability to choose the way that we see things, what we do and how we do them, or better yet, the way that the two questions that I always give during class uh, in here is, is what do you see and how do you see it, right? So let's start off with a chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 11. And in the Michelet, it says this. The treasure of a wealthy person is his city of strength and like a high wall in his chambers. Let me repeat that one more time. The treasure of a wealthy person is his city of strength and like a high wall in his chambers. So I, I, I did that on purpose because I wanted to put the emphasis in what the, the, the heart behind this particular verse was talking about. Because when we look at the place of, in particular, wealth, you know, that that sometimes people who are very wealthy will trust in their wealth. They believe that their wealth is all that they need to be able to handle anything that goes along. That includes that includes even their health and other things. And that and so they their trust is not in the father, but their trust is in that wealth. But I want to go back and I want to reread these two, this, this, this verse, except this time I want to go back to verse 10 on purpose, because I believe 10 and 11 kind of give us a better picture as we see the two of them uh, side by side. So if we look at verse 10 in the, I'm not, and I'm going to read it actually in the Passion Translation. All right, give me a second. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see that? Everybody good? Okay, good. All right. In the Passion Translation, verse 10 and verse 11 say this, The character of God is a tower of strength, for the lovers of God delight to run into his heart and be exalted on high. The rich in their conceit imagine that their wealth is enough to protect them. It becomes their confidence in a day of trouble. So the first, verse 10, we see this place of the character of God is a tower of strength. We see the, you know, the, 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 the typical verse that we usually hear is the name of the Lord is like a strong tower. The righteous run in and are saved. And so the 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 heart behind the focus of, of verse 10 is talking about that it's the Father who is that tower of strength. And when we begin to see the 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 goodness of God and the way that it really works, then we begin to understand why we're talking about how the difference can be here. And even to a certain extent, how potentially, see, I, I don't want to. It's it's one of those things where I'm 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 being careful with the words that I say, because it doesn't mean that every rich person is one who is imagines that their uh, money is all that they need. That's not true with everyone. And as we go on through the rest of the verses in this particular chapter, it's going to make a little bit more sense because what we're seeing is the is basically the place of the ego and the ego in the place of of have being. Uh, wealthy as a result of action that, that 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 person has done, and they they find that as being their their city instead of the the name of the Lord. And so, let 
In the Mishle, it says this, the wealthy person's treasure, which is his source, source of strength, should be the name of the Lord. As his material, as as for his material belongings, they are not a source of security, but rather, rather a means to serve the Lord. That's what the Mishle talks about. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to do here is talk about the goodness of God. You know, when we see the place of the goodness, God, there's there are four absolutes that you guys have heard me talk about. I'm just going to briefly mention them and then move on. And those four absolute is God is love. God is good. He always gives. And I am a son. Those are four absolutes. And so anything that comes in and tries to tell me otherwise, I can I can identify immediately as a lie because I recognize the fact that these are the absolutes of God. Now, one of those was being that God always gives, and he does. We are not able to have anything unless he first gives it to us, period. Everything comes from it. Everything is of him. I love this because when we, I'd like to go into the depth of the idea behind creation, at least from the Hebraic perspective, and talk about Zim Zoom. Uh, but I will mention this only slightly in the in the sense of saying that when you realize that that from the Hebraic perspective of how creation began was that God created a space inside of Himself, and that's where He placed creation into. Now, just that picture alone begins to open up this whole other perspective of saying, wait a minute, so we will we would we really would never know what it's like to be absent of the absent of the presence of God. Because if creation is in him, then all we know is the presence of God, whether we choose to receive it or not, whether we choose to see it or not. Remember, I do have the ability, we all do have the ability to put veils over our eyes. Those are not veils that God placed up, they're veils that we placed up and keep us from seeing the the the, the truth of what Father is trying to reveal to us. So when when you when you stop to think about this, when we look at the goodness of God and the fact that He always gives, then everything that we have comes from Him. See, that's also, if you can look at it together with me, it's also a place and a seat of rest that just as Paul talked about when he talked about, I have, I have abounded and I have been abased. In other words, I have, I've had a lot and then I've had very, very little. But one thing I do know is that in all things, I will give thanks, right? In all things, give thanks. And so there's this place of of where we are we're we're learning and we're growing and our proof I want I definitely want to say this cuz this is something that messed me up for a long time our proof of our righteousness and holiness isn't in the the numbers in our bank account it's not okay is that now in the same breath in the same breath, does that mean someone who has money in their bank account? It's that's 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 bad. No, 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 no. You're you're getting me whole completely wrong here, because as we go through the rest of this this chapter, we're going to begin to discover the heart behind what this is talking about, and that's the place of the intention of our heart. More than anything else, whether we abase or whether we abound, whether we have a lot or whether we have little, doesn't matter. That place of where we know that we are following after the Lord with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength, that in that place, then that is what the Father is looking at. That's the part that he's seeing. And he's going to make sure that he's that we're taken care of no matter what. You get you get the heart behind this. I know some of you may may be. In a place where you're you're having difficulty, some of you may be having problems or 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 trying to struggle and make it through the the day. And I'm telling you that the Lord is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Just hold tight, just hold tight, because the Father will show you and teach you as you walk through every uh, part of this. But now that's looking at it from the financial aspect. All right. Whenever we look at a scripture, don't ever think that it only just means one thing because we see the word treasure and immediately we think financial. 
I had to, I have to, I needed to address it because it's something that we all think about. But according to the Vilna Gaon, uh, Solomon is referring in this verse to a person's wealth of the knowledge of the word of God or Torah knowledge. The evil inclination attacks a person externally in the form of scoffers who mocks his observance of mitzvot or fulfilling the, that law and internally in the form of desires and distractions. So now we see this, this double-sided attack going on. And the truth is, is that we, we, all, we all know that. Sometimes, sometimes our external attack isn't always necessarily, uh, it's funny, I, I would sometimes call the external attack sometimes even our own, our own mind. All right. If you if you go if you go with me, in other words, we limit ourselves by the way that we see something, and I kind of see that as an external attack, uh, as opposed to the way that this this the Vilna Gaon says this in here, where the internal is in the form of desires and distractions. All right, because I can I can take those I can take that another another way if I look at it from that perspective. The whole idea behind it is the aura provides a person with the strength to ignore the cynics from without. And it also builds a wall to protect him from his passions within. Oh, okay. Now, wait a minute. Now, this is opening up a whole other ballgame here. Because we're looking at the place of, of, of loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength. You know, some people say that that it's not necessary to know the scripture. It's not necessary that, that the word of God is an ongoing word of God and that, that we can listen to him. Absolutely. Don't stop. Do not stop. But at the same breath, there's a place of an understanding that comes through those that have gone on before. And, and we see how they and how Father has specifically said it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. And he's talking about that place of his word and just simply digging into his word, especially as we look at it through the perspective of the living letters. Then we get, begin to see a whole nother ballgame, a whole nother aspect, and a deeper part of what the Father's trying to reveal in and through us. And it goes on to that last verse that we're going to be talking about here in just a little bit, where it says, uh, the spiritually hungry are always ready to learn more. I, I, I almost want to skip ahead to that, but I'm not going to. Uh, for their hearts are eager to discover new truths. You see, that's the heart behind this. Our heart of that place of being hungry. I, I love this. I love this beautiful paradox that Father, when I drink of the water that you have given, that I will thirst no more. And when I eat of the meat of your word, I will not be hungry anymore. And yet every morning I wake up hungry. Every morning I wake up thirsty. <laughs> now, now that, that seems like a paradox, but is it? The more that I know, the more that I want to know. Anyway, we'll get into that here in just a, a little bit. So let's not look at the place of this treasure here. And as, you, as we begin to look through the place of treasure, then let's let's remember that this can mean more than just financial when it comes to the place of treasure. Uh, in, in the Passion Translation, verse 11 says this, The rich in their conceit imagine that their wealth is enough to protect them. It, it becomes their confidence in a day of trouble. Now, so instead of us looking at the financial aspect of this, then let's look at the wisdom aspect of this. Because see, the same can be true in the place of where I have a lot of knowledge, but it's knowledge that has separated itself from God. Now, uh, I, I almost... I almost I, I, I'm trying to to determine the best way of saying saying this because many times when we look at that aspect of it, we always think academic. Being academic is not wrong because there is an academic, if you will, expression that begins to help to teach us even more about His Word and the world around us, and how he created the world, and how everything works together. And so, I think, it again, it goes back to that place of the intention of our hearts. Why do we want to be academic? 
why do we want to spend time in the world word? Why do we want to dig into the, the scriptures? Well, it's, it's not just be able to check off a box saying that I've done it, but it's really that place of that hunger that, that has been there, even though I'm full, but that hunger that comes in the, in that place where we we step out, I, I don't think I'm articulating it as well as I'd like to. So, Holy Spirit, I just I turn this over to you and ask you to to bring this. Just just don't get wrapped up wrapped up in the, the fact of negating the academic only for the experiential, or negating the experiential only for the academic. Both are necessary. Both teach us. Both will teach us from totally different perspectives. And it it does exactly what the Vilna Gaon goes on to say, uh, that it uh, it provides us with strength to ignore cynics from without. In other words, people trying to tell us you're crazy. And it, and, uh, it also builds a wall to protect from our own passions within. I'm reminded of the, uh, the hedge of thorns that the father spoke around uh gomer and which was hosea's wife and how he he was used he used this hedge of thorns now i i remember as the lord began to to reveal to me about that that hedge of thorns i realized that it wasn't just a protection from the outside but the thorns poked on both sides (laughs) so when gomer was trying to get out it poked and anybody trying to get in it poked so there was these goads there, these thorns there that that protected on both sides, if you will. And what did it do? It brought her to the place of recognizing, Father, it was you. I want to go back to my first husband because it was with him that I that I was things were so much better. And I began to realize that it was from my first husband, the Lord, that that I got my grain, my oil, my wine, and so on. And she returns back to him in that place. Read Hosea chapter two, and you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. Let's go on. All right, verse twelve says this in the Mishle. Prior to his destruction, a man's heart grows haughty, but prior to honor, there is humility. Now I love this because Rabag actually kind of makes a another rephrases the sentence a little bit. I like the way that he says this. Pride and arrogance cause a person's downfall. Humility brings honor. And of course, we can't talk about humility or honor or even pride without thinking about James chapter 4, uh, verse 10. Um, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You know, for I, and I'm, I'm still walking through this, truth be told. And that's that place of standing in absolute rest, no matter what. During one of our class, during our class in the, the School of the Living Letters, uh, this Monday, we were talking about the Living Letter uh, Tzadi. And one of the things that we talked about was there was a song that really stirred my heart with regards to this. And the name of the the, the song in Hebrew is called uh, Ko Ha'olam Kulo. And the basic understanding of what the heart of this in English, this particular song talks about, is it says this, that the world is a very narrow bridge. And the one thing that is the most important is that we have no fear at all. No fear at all. Save maybe the spirit of the fear of the Lord. All right, say maybe that, but no fear in the sense of fearing of things that are going on, that place of absolute rest. You see, when we when we look at this, let's go, especially if we go back to verse 11, 
<clears throat> when we're looking at verse 12 here, that that prior to his destruction, a man's heart grows haughty. Verse 11 is talking about the rich in their conceit. Imagine that their wealth is enough to protect them. And so there's this place of the haughtiness and the and the 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 ego, if you will, the the pride that comes in that place of being able to have that that money. I'm thinking of someone in particular that that I know well, but they're they're young and they're still growing and they're still got a lot to learn. But that that there's a part of this verse that kind of sticks out to me when I as I think about them. And uh, but the the heart behind this really has to do with the place of humble humility of humbleness and how do we see that place of humbleness in hebrew the hebrew word for uh, humble if you will or humility is the hebrew word ana ayin nun and hey now when we look at the living letter I, and I don't have one, I'd well look this up on Google as we're, as we're going through this. Uh, the living letter I, and looks like a Y that's kind of the best way of being able to look at. So you've got this curved line as opposed to a straight line. And then the line that comes from the other side to, to look like what we would think would think of would be a, a Y in English. But when you look at these, there are actually two living letters. The curved outer part of the living letter ayin is the living letter nun. And the best way of describing the living letter nun is the humbled prince, the humbled one. And the reason why it is, it's, is that's the case is because this is what the living letter nun would look like using my, my two fingers here. You've got this upper part that bends at the top, a straight line, and then a bend at the bottom. So in the picture of the way that the living letter Nun looks, there is a humility to God being humble in his sight, and then a humility to men. All right, being humble. We got it, we can't, we can't think about any other scripture when we unless we think about the place of where that Yeshua himself humbled himself to the place of being a servant, right? So we're talking about the humbled servant, the humbled son. But there's another way of looking at the living letter ayin. So I described the the nun on the the right side of of the, or if you will, the the base of the Y. And then there's this additional piece that that comes out from the the side. That that this is where see this is the ayin, and this is the other part of the Y, which is this finger here, right? And the that letter can be seen a couple of different ways, but one of the way that you're going to discover as you dig into to, uh, the Hebraic perspective is that it's the living under Zion. Now Zion is a crown of Av. So when you think about the place of of say someone coming to the place of maturity, someone to the come to the place of of authority then the living letter Zion would be the letter that you would associate with them. I, I, I actually associate the living letter Zion as a business letter. It's a perfect business letter because it speaks about the place of, of if you will, um, plowing something up. So, so it's, it, it can be seen as a plowshare. The living letter Zion can be seen as a plowshare. And so you've got the place of growth. You've got the place of where business begins to build and then grow from, from that place. But, Zion can also be seen as a sword. All right, so let's go back to this picture. You got the the nun here, which is the which is the left side of the or the right side of the the um, iron, and then you've got the part that sticks out right here that creates the Y aspect of it. Right. So when you when you look at that 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 uh, plowshare can also be seen as a sword. And so what the sword does is it goes in and it cuts open the belly of the sun to see what's in this, it's all what's on the inside. Hmm. That kind of reminds me of a scripture. Doesn't it you? That place of where David cried out, Father, search my heart and see if there be any wicked thing in me. Remember that scripture? So to me, that's a perfect picture of what the Zion is doing in the middle of the Hebrew letter Ayin. 
Ayin is a letter that speaks about being able to see. But when we start talking about how the Zion, that sword that's poking open the belly and seeing it's what's on the inside, I can't help but also start to see the the expression of Bina or understanding. In other words, that with that revelation of this Hebrew word ana, it's it's talking about that place of of not only introspection, all right, and looking at what's on the inside of us. It also opens up that place of what do I see and how do I see it. So let's let's continue on. You see, ana has a living letter nun as the second letter in there. We've got ayin and now nun. So we've got we've got nun in there twice, don't we? Because we've got it hidden inside of the ayin, and now we actually have it see it uh, hit uh, in the actual spelling of the Hebrew word. Anytime you see, even if it's hidden, anytime you see two letters side by side, it's always important, whether it's hidden or whether it's not. See, I'm teaching you kind of a, a secret of digging into the Hebrew and how you can see things that many would just skip over and not even know that we're there. But anytime you see two letters that are the same side by side, whether it's hidden like it is in the ayin or not, it speaks about that place of Father establishing it in the heavens and it also being established in the earth. Okay. And he also means this place of it coming about quickly as well. And so just, just as David, when he prayed that prayer, Father, search my heart and see if there be any wicked thing in me. What did the Lord do? From that point is where David started to fall into all of the myriad things that he fell into. The uh, adultery with Bathsheba, the killing of Uriah, all the other many other things that that according to the scripture looks as if David was probably one of the worst sinners in the world. But yet when the Lord described him, what did he say? He is a man after my own heart. Why? Because as soon as he recognized that place of what was in him, he immediately returned. He immediately went back to the father recognized what was wrong, laid out in that place of recognizing. And I'm going to go over this here in just a, in just a minute. He, he began to understand that there was some things in him that needed to be dealt with, and he dealt with them, no matter how hard or how difficult they are. So nun, uh, ana, ayin, nun, we've talked about those two letters. And then the final letter in the Hebrew word for humility is the living letter hey. And it speaks to frame by breath and speech, that which is in or from the heart. So when we look at this, that humility brings us to the place of recognizing. You see, recognizing that place of, if you will, when I've done something wrong, when I've, now, I, you know, when I've done something wrong, I'm just going to stick with where, where I was going with this. Then, then I have two choices. I can hide it or I can make it open before the Lord. I can deny that it happened and cover it over. And if you will, put a veil over it. Or I can allow that to be that veil to be removed, open that up to the Father and deal with it. Now, I'm going to go into this in just a little bit. All right. I'm, I'm going to stop right there in this. But you talk about the place of when you speak about humility, when you realize that, Lord, my heart really, above all, above all else, is to love you with all of my heart, my soul, and my strength. And I'm not trying to be anything except a son, except being one with you. That's my whole heart and my whole focus. Let's go on. I want to get to the verse 14, because that's that's the part where I'm going to bring in everything that I've talked about up to this point. All right, verse 13 in the Mishlei says this, If a person answers before he understands, it will be fully foolishness and humiliation for him. <laughs> How many times have you have you done that? How many times have I done that? Forget how many times have, have you? How many times have I done that? 
And and I've I've started to answer a question only to realize you didn't hear the question. <laughs> and it's foolish. It really is. Because, you know, without that place of being able to understand what the person is trying to articulate, it's going to end up making us seem silly and even a bit prideful because we um, assumed, right? <laughs> all of us know all of us know about the assuming thing, right? That uh, I know my, my mom used to tell me that when I was a kid growing up. You know what assuming does? I, I won't say it on here, but but it it you you guys have heard that before, I'm sure. If not, ask somebody else and they'll tell you. <laughs> uh, but it it really it really brings us to that place of showing what's in our heart about discounting what other people have to say. You know, one of the things that we talk about a lot in here, one of the things that we do in here, the heart behind what we do in here is in that place of having that engagement time together. And so those of you that are just now joining us uh, on YouTube, if you would like to join us for the classes, please do, because we have a part of this class that is not recorded at all whatsoever, and it's not recorded on purpose so that we have the opportunity for everybody to be able to share and not have to worry about it going out onto, uh, onto international you know, video. Uh, so it's the heart behind that is that in that place of where there's safety and there's a place of being able to share that, then we can we can discuss things that we might not could discuss any other time or any other way. And then really be able to honor one another in the way that we see things. But until, unless we we really take this heart to heart and we begin to understand and stop and listen before we actually respond, then we're going to seem foolish to anybody or and really harmful to someone else. Cause then they're like, well, you're not, you're not wanting to listen to me. You don't want to hear me. And that hurts. That hurts someone. You see, the I found that um, the heart behind this really, and, and I believe that even in this particular scripture here, in the, the Proverbs, there is a different word that is used for hearing. There's another word that usually is used for hearing throughout scripture, but there's there the beautiful aspect of or the beautiful perspective of the Hebrew is that that sometimes there are different words that describe different aspects of the same thing. And so in this case, the Hebrew word Yishma, Yishma is normally is translated as hear, but in this particular scripture, it's translated as understanding or to understand. So the heart behind that, all right, let's go uh, just do a quick recap of, of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge real quick. Uh, I know all, most of you guys that are in here right now, I've heard this a thousand times if you've heard it once, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the ones who are, are joining us and, and listening on, the, on YouTube so that you have a basic understanding of what, we, what we're talking about here. You see, Father began to teach me about the place of how wisdom, understanding, and knowledge work together. And the best way of describing is, is that wisdom is one. Wisdom is echad. In Hebrew, uh, echad is the Hebrew word for one. So in other words, there is no division within the wisdom of God. It is all him. Okay? Now, I know that the way that we normally describe wisdom, especially from a Western church mindset, what we're really describing is not wisdom but actually understanding because the wisdom of God always will be connected. It was, it will always express the oneness and the one. And, and even though it may be different perspectives, it will allow us to see both sides of a situation or the multifaceted sides of a situation. And they will all agree because it's wisdom. It's one it's, it's meant there's no, there's no separation there. But an understanding is where separation begins. But that's not a negative thing. Now, I know we, we always think, well, we don't want to be separated from God. No, hold on, hold on a minute. 
let's look at the body. The best way of describing it is let's look at the body and look at all the cells that are within our body. The, the science says that there are trillions and trillions and trillions of cells inside of our body. If I look at every one of those cells and how every one of those cells are absolutely necessary to make my body operate and work as it was intended to, then each one of those cells are going to be given a portion of that wisdom so that it can complete that which what that that it was intended to complete. Make sense? And so that means that I may have a part of something and you may have a part of something. Let's say we're two cells that are working in the same area, but I've got one job and you've got another job. Now, should I tear you down because you're not doing the same job I'm doing? Are we all supposed to look exactly alike and be exactly alike within the body of Christ? Can the head say to the, the rest of the body, I have no need of you? Can the hand say to the foot, I have no need of you? No, every one of those is absolutely necessary. And so, but that that it's in the place of how we begin to recognize how those different perspectives begin to form back together into echad, into the one it starts to make more sense. Now we begin to operate as the body of Christ and, and honoring every part of the body. I want to go on just a little bit more. I know I've repeated this in this class multiple times. It's, it's kind of like the difference between the hand and the foot. The hand has a set of laws that govern the way that it works because the hand is able to do things that the foot's not able to do. Now, the foot is the same thing. The foot is governed by, if you will, another set of laws that allow it to do the very thing that it was intended to do. And that's to carry us from one point to another, to hold up the rest of our body, right? Now, if I was to turn around and walk on my hands all the time, my hands were never intended to do that. And so there would be problems in me trying to walk on my hands all the time. If I was to try to pick up and and I know people do this with with that have uh, super abilities. I don't call them disabilities. I call them super abilities that may have uh, uh, an issue where they they don't have a or they're they're paralyzed or they can't. They have no hands or something like that, and they use their feet to do beautiful things. You know, uh, I remember Joni. I don't know if some of you. I'm, I'm telling my age with this. You know, but Joni was an artist that she put a paintbrush in her mouth and she would paint with her mouth. And so there's there's a beautiful expression in being able to overcome those places. But again, how can my hand say to my foot, I have no need of you because my foot's going to take me to where I need to go. And my hands are there to then be able to do the detailed work that they were intended to do. So this understanding really comes into the place now. The this Hebrew word is the yishma is there's a there's actually a uh, a root to that and some of you will have would have will have heard this before and that's the Hebrew word sh- shema and especially as it as it applies to uh, a, a a verse that in Hebrew is spoken every day it's the shema the shema prayer and that is shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It goes on, but I'm going to stop right there for now. The In English, that would be, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's out of Deuteronomy. But this word Shema actually talks about this place of to hear intelligently. Now, that often comes with the implication of attention, of paying attention, of being open to be able to look at something from multiple sides. What if somebody believes I had, we had a conversation prior to the the class today. And and in this conversation, we were talking about looking at about, about how other people do things. And, and in one, one particular case, we were talking about a pastor who, whose upbringing was in a, a, a different, uh, um, denomination, if you will, and and uh, well, well, a denomination where there was uh, a lot of liturgy, and liturgy being that place of where you've got the the processes of things going on. So the the uh, 
you know, the process of the, like the sensor coming down the aisle and the, the table and the layout of the table and the, the, the taking of the communion and, and that sort of thing. And, and from a non-denominational perspective, we look at that and say, well, why, why, would, why does everybody do that? That's crazy. Come on now, hold on a minute. There is a beauty in the understanding of the way that liturgy expresses and we we count it as little or nothing because we think, eh, well, it's so different from the way that I do things. They're, they're doing it all wrong. Oh, are they? What if I took the moment just to look and be able to see the understanding or, or the, the deeper understanding of what that liturgy is expressing and what it's talking about and, and be able to learn from that, learn from something that, that may be completely outside of my understanding and so I, I'm I'm paying attention to the details behind everything. One of the beautiful things, and this is where the, the Hebrew has taught me probably more than anything else. Uh, the Hebrews taught me about this place of pay, paying attention is in when I began to discover the place of, of how there are even the vowel sounds that are in Hebrew, the way that a Hebrew word is pronounced is actually even more important than the word itself. Now go figure, because the vowel sounds are smaller than even the letters are. But you'll find you'll find something, you'll discover something then within the scripture. You'll, you'll discover something within the Hebraic perspective. And that is the smaller something is, the greater it is. The smaller something is, the greater it is. It's like the living letter Yod. The living letter Yod is the smallest of all of the letters, yet it contains everything that was in creation, including the letters themselves. It began with a dot of light and began to expand and, and uh, grow into the creation that we know. So just because it's little doesn't mean it's bad. Matter of fact, it's a higher form than he, actually the word is. So think about it. We think about frequency, right? The way that we say something, the frequency behind the way that we say it is equally, actually, it's more important than the word itself, because the frequency adds in intonation and inflection. And we can learn more from actually the sound and nonverbal cues than we can sometimes from the word itself. So don't count those little things as being little or nothing because they're actually great and by paying attention to them then it begins to open up the place of understanding make sense all right so let's dig on to, to verse 14 um, i'm going to read the passion translation first because i don't think i've read it from the passion translation but verse 13 says this listen before you speak for to speak before you've heard the facts will bring humiliation preach it all right, there you go. Maybe we should have just said that verse and then went on because I think that pretty well answers the question. I love the way that he translated this here. It's going to humble us, you know. Well, let's go back to verse 12 where it talks about the, the place of, of humbleness. Actually, let's read verse 12 because I just realized I didn't read it in the Passion Translation either. A man's heart is proudest when his downfall is nearest, for he won't see glory until the Lord sees humility. And then verse th 13 goes into listen before you speak for to speak before you've heard the facts will bring humiliation. It will humble you. Cause then you're going to realize that you thought you knew what they were talking about and you didn't. All right. So let's go on to verse 14 in the Mishle. It says this, a man's spirit will sustain him in his sickness, but who can support a broken spirit? In the Passion Translations, Dr. Simmons writes this, The will to live sustains you when you're sick, but depression crushes courage and leaves you unable to cope. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, and I, and I can see the heart behind the way that Dr. Simmons wrote this. And he brings up a beautiful perspective of this, because he's right. You know, when, when our, our, our spirit has been broken, it... One of the things that that leaves us is the place of courage because we're it's like we feel like, well, why do I need to go on anymore? Why don't I just give up? You know, 
I was in the medical field for far too long and saw that over and over and over again. When people, even young people, just plain and simply gave up. And it and it actually manifested itself in a in a bunch of different ways, the drug overdoses and suicides and and as well as many other things that that happen. But they just plain and simply give up. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that their their spirits have been broken. When someone really gets to the place of where they cannot see a way out. You know what I'm saying? It's difficult. Matter of fact, our Bacha points out a diseased spirit is much harder to heal than a diseased body. And he's right. Because, anyway. Um, I'm reminded of my own situation. And I remember back when I was about 15 years old, I got to the place where that happened. And I got to the place where I thought that, that uh, there was no way out, that I, I just, I didn't see things were hard and difficult. And, and I was, you know, my, it, just any number of things. My parents were having difficulties at the time. And uh, continue to even have difficulties after that. But I know I'm being very vulnerable right here. And I'm doing so in a, not in a way of, of, of anything else other than a place of freedom. Not for me, but for others who may be dealing with something along this line that may be hearing this right now. But I remember at 15, now I, me trying to actually kill myself. I did. I tried. Now, immediately, as soon as I did what I was doing, I I immediately called uh, my best friend's mom, and I, I didn't want to call my parents because of the trouble that that. But part of the the thing that was going on had to do with them as well, and so I called my best friend's mom and uh, and told her what I had just done. So the truth was that I really didn't want to die. But I knew that I, I needed to say, hey, I, somebody see me. Somebody see me. Now, from that place, the father grabbed the hold of my heart and began to, to show me. And I realized after that, that that I would never do that again. It was it was just not. I really did have more to live for than I thought I did at that particular time. But it was a broken. It was a broken spirit. But the last part of this verse begins to open up something, and I want to talk about this for just a minute, because. A man's spirit will sustain him in sickness. Okay, so let's let's talk about that first. All right, because I haven't talked about that aspect of it yet. Think about that. When when our spirit man is in the place of me resting in the heart of the Father. Once again, let me use one of my own stories that I remember when when I had a, a gallbladder uh, issue and didn't know it was a gallbladder. All I know is that I was in my my stomach was in a lot of pain and it wasn't going away no matter how hard I tried. As I got into the doctors and they discovered what was going on, it was actually a gangrenous uh, gallbladder. It had gotten so bad that it, it had turned into gangrene. And uh, they had to end up cutting me open a little bit more than they thought they would in order to be able to get it out because of the, the size of the stones as well as the gangrenous aspect of it. And uh, I, was, I was pretty sick for uh, a few days, but my spirit man was not. Many of you who have been with us a while, especially in the School of Living Letter, remember me talking about this because this was where the Lord showed me the goodness of God in a way that I've never, ever been able to describe or never been able to express and really feel until this particular time. And I, I remember throughout the whole process of, of what was going on, when I finally did go to the doctor, they took a look. And told me what was going on. I had a peace 
that passed all understanding. I, I, I'm, I'm still, I still kind of go back to that place of, I didn't deny that I wasn't sick. I didn't deny that there wasn't a problem, but I did recognize that what father was doing was something far beyond what I could have thought or imagined in that place. And so God came in, felt at peace with the surgery, felt at peace to go into it. They did the surgery. And, and of course, after it was done, there was the medications and so on. But there was this beautiful place about every time that I fell asleep and every time that I was awake, I could sense this, this heightened aspect. I know some of you are going to say, well, it was the drugs. Okay, whatever. Diminish it if you want. <laughs> Diminish it if you want, because I know what it was. I know what, what the father was doing. But and, and I felt this sense of peace, and especially when I fell asleep, because I was going to places in my, my sleep. And I remember one particular uh, Saturday afternoon, and I told my wife, I said, Sunday at 3 p.m., I said, I'm going to fall asleep. The Lord's told me this already. I'm going to fall asleep at Sunday at 3 p.m., and the Lord is going to meet me. And him and, it's just going to be a meeting with just him and I. And it felt it felt to me as, almost as if the Lord was saying, I'm stopping everything else and just paying attention to you at this, this point. Now, can he do that? Yeah, absolutely. He can do that. But, and, and can he do that and still be go- dealing with everything else that's going on? Yeah, of course he can, you know, but what did it make me feel like? Man, it made me feel special, you know, and, and, and especially since he had told me ahead of time what he was wanting to do. And so sure enough, Sunday afternoon, at probably 2.55, <laughs> or right close to that, I fell asleep and was asleep during the three o'clock hour. And when in the dream, because I started, I had I had very lucid, very detailed dreams during that whole time I was in the hospital. And I had a lucid dream. And uh, in this dream, the Lord and I were walking side by side in the secret place. And we walked up to this big door. And I'm going to cut to the chase because I want to make sure that we talk about some other things here. But uh, he took me to this big door and I looked at him and I looked at the door and the door seemed enormous, but the Lord walked up to it, grabbed a hold of the handle and opened it up, but he only opened it up just a crack. And he gave me permission to be able to look inside. And so I stuck my head in that crack that he had, had opened there. And the only way that I could describe to you what was on the other side of the door was his goodness. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. I I can't describe it in words or anything. And I remember as soon as I recognized what it was, and I recognized it was the goodness of God, I reached out my hand and and I grabbed a hold of his goodness. And I looked at him and I said, I am not going to let go. I remember when the Lord started to teach me about peace and, and it made sense when I was talking, when he started talking about the place of, of how uh, that scripture that talks about in the, king, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. And I realized that both with his peace and with his goodness, there was this place of where he was allowing me to reach out, grab a hold, and then no matter what happened, I chose to not let go. Even if everything else was batting me around like crazy, I would not let go of his goodness. And so that to me did everything for establishing that place inside of me where just as I was going through this this surgery and the sickness and everything else that was going on, uh, truth be told, I vaguely remember parts of it one of the things that they were concerned about during this time while I was in there was that I ended up with pneumonia. And I'm like, pneumonia? Why? They were saying a bunch of things that I, I could hear on the outside of me, but that's not what happened because by the time I left the hospital and I started getting home, I was fine. I was absolutely fine and uh, was was in this place of, of taking what the Lord had showed me in this place and running with it. My body quickly uh, began to heal as a result of that. So I've seen the I've seen that side of it as well. But there's a part of this that I wanted to talk about today, especially when it goes to the place of the broken spirit. When I anytime I hear that phrase or anytime I hear that verse, especially as it applies to verse 14, 
I can't help but think about Psalms 51, verse 17. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You would not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Now, this whole time, I've been talking about the place of a broken spirit, and I've been looking at it from the perspective of how situations and things and, and the way that we see things, what do you see and how do you see it? The way that we see things kind of begins to weigh heavy on us, and, and, and it doesn't allow us to see the goodness of God that's hidden behind everything. No matter what happens, no matter where we are, no matter anything that's going on with the earth, all any affliction that we walk through, any difficulty that we walk through, there is always a treasure that the Father has placed and hidden in the midst of that. And we have a choice to either deal with the problem or focus nothing but on the problem or look for the treasure instead choosing not to to pay attention to just the troubles and how hard and how difficult it is but to run after the treasures you guys have heard me talk about this before that was the time that i got the revelation of of saying why in the world am i looking at troubles being troubles why can't i start looking at them as being treasure hunts and it changed my whole attitude because now i was i was not looking to figure out why the problem was there I was just looking straight for the solution. I was looking straight for the treasure that I knew that the Father had in there. You following me? And so, when we look at this place of broken spirit, that there's also another way that we can look at this. Because in the place as I approach the Father, This connects us back into the place of humility. Remember I told you guys I was going to talk about this when we got a little bit further down. You know, remember the the other verses where we were talking about humbleness and humility? This begins to open up a whole other side of this. You see, if I look at it from the broken spirit of the way that I was describing it just a few moments ago, it really is looking at things from an external perspective. And it's looking at things from this perspective of how everything is meant to try to crush me or to cause me to fail or to break my spirit as in the sense of of breaking me. But what if I chose to have the heart of a broken spirit? There's a scripture that says this, it is better to fall on the rock and to be broken than to let the rock fall on you and be crushed to powder. The metaphor is talking about that place of, you see, if I look at it from, a, from an external perspective, really it's the rock that falls on me and crushes me to powder. When the heart behind this is that the, the father is taking me to this place of me falling down on the rock and my spirit being broken from that place. Now, what do I mean by that? Because, you know, the truth is, is that's it's kind of a hard thing to to really describe, except to say this. One of the things that, as the Father has taken me through, and one of the things, especially as it applies to, we did a class not too terribly long ago, and it's on uh, YouTube, so if you'd like to go take a listen to it, it's uh, the quantum time travel. And in there, I talk about a way of, if you will, being able to go back into the past and replant, like the scripture talks about, to to, to rip up a, a root of bitterness and to replant something else, and then to come back to the present where it begins to reveal to us that place where it's already grown. In other words, it's a way of me learning how to overcome my views of the way things work. It's not going back and changing the past as opposed to where, where things have been you know, wrong or whatever the case may be, changing the details of what happened in that past. But what it does do is it goes back and it changes the way that I see that 
and my interpretation of that and how it's made me feel. You see, when I when I think about this, I think about the place of where that it was through this vav hey vav that the father began to teach me about this place. See, one of the things that, that the vav hey vav talk about, vav hey vav is one of the 72 names of God. You'll have to listen to the video to get the full understanding of what I'm talking about. Uh, but it's it's in this vav hey vav, the first thing that you need to do is to go back and to look at the situation. You know, the let the Lord just just one situation. Don't try to to take in everything all at once. Do it one by one as the Lord brings it up and as the as the Father gives you the opportunity to do that. Because we we can't handle the everything at once kind of aspect of it. It needs to be one at a time and looking at it. And I remember as a part of that, what the Lord had me do was I had to go back and remember the feelings of the that I had during that particular issue, whether it be something that happened to me or whether it be something that I did myself. In doing so, it opens up the place of emotion and we begin to feel a lot of the pain and a lot of the difficulty of that particular issue and that particular situation. But it gives us an opportunity to be able to deal with it. To be able to recognize that I don't have to push out my emotion. You know, one of the ways that that I remember for years that the Lord would teach me, or excuse me, that I thought piety meant or being pious meant was to squash my emotions. Now, I should not be run by emotions. No, don't do not be be overcome and overwhelmed and run by your emotions. But we have to deal with them, too. There is a place of dealing with that emotion. Anybody that talks about trauma will tell you that you have to deal with the way you felt about it. And then to be able to, to overcome that. And I began to see that in this place, what I was doing was really opening up my heart of being able to recognize, wait a minute. Especially when it was something that I had done. Who do I have to blame? Who do I blame? Do I blame the devil? Do I believe Satan? Do I blame? Who do I blame? The truth is, is I have no one else to blame but myself. Because even the scripture tells me that man is drawn away by his own lusts and drawn away to, to do those sins. So I have no one else to blame but myself. So when I begin to move to that aspect of it, You talk about the place of then being broken, falling down on that rock and saying, Lord, I have no one else to blame but myself. But I also know that you have given me that place of overcoming. You have taught me how to overcome. And so in that place where I recognize that it's my fault, that Only I'm responsible for anything that happened. I'm responsible even for any reaction, anything that happens as a result of that. I begin to realize that the the only thing I can trust in, the only one I can trust in is you, Father. Because I've opened up my heart and and recognized. It was me. But when I stopped to recognize the wisdom of what that saying, it's huge. Because when I realize that I'm the one that made the choice, then guess what? I'm the one that doesn't have to make that same choice again. I'm the one who can see another way, see another perspective. I love that because in Hebrew, I've discovered that sometimes many words that have a negative response to it, and I'm not going to get into one right now, but that have a negative definition also has a way of escape hidden within those same letters if you choose to look at them from another perspective. 
Now, I've gone over several of them in these classes before, and I don't have time right now. You see, the heart behind all of this is in teshuva. The word teshuva in Hebrew is normally translated as repentance. But teshuva in its most literal translation literally means returning. And so it's in that place of where just as the Hebrew word uh, chata, which is the Hebrew word for sin, one of the Hebrew words for sin, speaks about that place of missing the will of God. It's me recognizing that I've missed the will of God and then return back to that place. And so it's just like what I was talking about. You know, it's, 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 it seems kind of crazy. Why would I want to go back and revisit my sins, right? Well, there's a purpose behind it. There's a purpose behind it in the sense of me recognizing, wait a minute, there was a wisdom that I could have learned before, and now Father's given me the opportunity to, to go back and revisit that, to learn how to be able to overcome that from that point forward, where those, those ones that we were talking about from without and within, remember we were talking about that earlier? Um, the aura provides a person with the strength to ignore the cynics from without. And it also builds a wall to protect him from his passions within. We're talking about the word of God. We're talking about knowing the word, knowing Torah. All right. Now, I don't want you guys to, especially if you're Christians, I don't want you to get wrapped up in the fact that I'm saying, just read the first five books of the Bible. No, when I say Torah, I'm, I'm expressing the whole entire scripture itself. And I'm, I'm talking about that place of, of, of the revealing of what the word of God is, is showing us. I love this because it, when we think about teshuva, we think about that place of saying and recognizing. But I want to bring something up, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna speak it, and then I'm gonna leave it alone, and then we'll continue on. Let's look at verse Psalm 51, verse 17, yet again. And I'm going to look at verses uh, 16 and 17 in particular. Um, I Oh, by the way, I was reading 15 through 17 earlier, not, not just 17. But 16 and 17, or 16 says this, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Doesn't matter how many cows or how many goats or how many turtle doves or how many anything that we throw on the, on the fire of the sacrifice. The father is looking at is that of a broken and a contrite heart. One who recognizes that, yes, Lord, I am, I choose to fall on you, the rock to be broken only for you to mend me back together again and make me as one in you. And in doing so, I, I, I realize the place you talk about humility I mean, you talk about the, the height of humility. This is what we're talking about. This Everything that we've been talking about this whole day has come to this one verse. Let's go ahead and wrap it up with verse 15. Like I said, I'm going to stop right there. An understanding heart will acquire knowledge. But the heir of the wise must seek knowledge. Make sure I read that right, because I think. An understanding heart will acquire knowledge, but the ear of the wise must seek knowledge, not the heir, the ear. I knew that that was not right. 
The ear of the wise must seek knowledge. So what are we talking about? When we're understanding towards something, there's going to be a knowledge that you remember how I talked about understanding earlier and how uh, understanding is where division begins. And so one who truly understands is one who can look at things from a multiple perspectives and then be able to put those together to be able to move together in a direction or trying to accomplish something as a whole, because there is wisdom in a multitude of of knowledge. There's a wisdom in a multitude of counsel is what it says there. And so it, it opens up that place of, of us recognizing that each of us have a part to play. And you'll, you're, you may bring up something that I had not thought of and vice versa. And so just having a simply plain and simply an understanding heart brings us to that place where we're going to acquire knowledge. Now, I didn't talk about knowledge earlier because knowledge is that place of where we take the wisdom and the understanding, especially as we as we've learned through understanding, taking those pieces together. And then knowledge is where we make it tangible in the earth itself. So knowledge takes it from the place of the, the mental, if you will, to the I don't know why I keep hearing this, but from the mental to the visceral. It's taking it from here, but to make it as a part of who we are in the uh, in here, and also in bringing it into tangibility where we can actually touch it within the earth itself. And many times, even a visceral response towards something is also bringing it into uh, bringing it into fruition because that visceral response in ourselves is that that we have trained uh, trained is trained the right word. That we have trained our soul by our spirit to then respond in the way that we know is in line with the beauty of who the Father is. In other words, I have taken my flesh, brought my flesh under control as much as I possibly can to the place where when I respond in the middle of a difficult situation, it's not a fleshly response. But it's one where I sit there and be quiet about and look at and then or that's one way of doing it or my visceral response, my automatic response, especially if I need to respond right away, is that of out of the wisdom that father has taught me in that place, because I've taken that wisdom and understanding, brought it together into the place of where I've looked at it from all the multiple sides And then I bring it to the place of the planting inside of my heart, that visceral response. And and in the planting in my heart, now the fruit that comes out of that response is that of the peace of God, is that of the recognition of the goodness of God, of that of, of being at rest and at peace and not responding in the place of, of fear. All right. Remember the song we talked about? The whole the the world is a narrow bridge, and the one the one most important thing is to not fear at all. But when we look at the ear of the wise person, the chacham in Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word chacham. Chacham is uh, it's it's related to chokma, which we know is the Hebrew word for wisdom. But a chacham is one who is a wise person. Okay. And and so a wise person then seeks after that place of taking the wisdom of God, learning and understanding, and then making it tangible on the earth. I've said this before, and I'll say it a thousand times again, that, that are we waiting for God to build the new Jerusalem, or are we the new Jerusalem? And as we come together as one, that we are building that place of the new Jerusalem here on the earth. I don't want to get into any 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 uh, eschatology here. I'm just I'm I'm looking at that whole statement from a metaphoric perspective perspective in how that each and every one of us is being one. That who says that we don't live right now in a place where the light of God never it goes out? Who said that? Did, did religion tell me that? Because religion told me that I have to wait for the new Jerusalem. But wait a minute. I'm in him, and he's in me, and he is light, and he's given me his light. Wait a minute. 
I'm already living in a place where the light of my father never goes out. There is no, because in him, there is light and there is no darkness at all. There is no darkness, no variables, no shadow of turning. Another scripture says, right? Oh, but wait, let's, 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 let's add us back into there. Because doesn't John chapter one say that in him was life and the life was the light of men. I mean, I mean come on, we let's, let's take the scripture from, for the part of what it was intended to be. And that not that we're waiting for some future event, but that it's now. That it really, truly is now. So it is from this place that I'm going to speak over every one of you guys today. I'm going to leave that right there. But I'm to, I want to pray this blessing over each and every one of you guys. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face his countenance, his presence towards you, and give you peace. Blessings. Shalom. We love you guys. Join us in the class. We'd love to see you here.